Good morning and welcome to Pray First, the conversation we have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. Hashtag live, you're joining us during the 7 o'clock hour on this Wednesday, April 21st, I believe it is, 2021. So 2121, hashtag recorded if you join us at any other time. Hashtag shared if you'll put this out on your page and let your friends and family know about Pray First. Pray First is more than just the 7 o'clock conversation that we have Monday through Friday. It's also a principle that we give God the first of our day, the first of our week, the first of our month, the first of our year. And that begins with the first of our day. So before we roll out of bed, before we grab our phone and check our messages or grab our remote and check the television or, you know, check our social media uh, apps or check, you know, messenger, text, anything like that, we give God the first of our day. Hit the hearts, hit the lights, go crazy on those and let our first time guests know that we are so glad they are here. I'm taking a little, um, a moment today to talk to you about why when matters. Why, when matters. Everybody hashtag why. Why? What's the reason? What's the cause? Why? When? The time in which something happens. The date. When? Why? For what cause? Does the date matter? Why does the time, why does the season, why does the year, why does the why? Why, when matters. We're going to talk about that a little bit today because we have now read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic Gospels. We've now read through the book of Proverbs, the works of Solomon, Lemuel, uh, and, and, and we're getting into the book of Acts, which is the book about the Acts of the Apostles. It's a, a real fun word, the apostolos, la, 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 acts de mandos is the real word. It's something that, you know, I'm glad they shortened it to the Acts. It is the Acts of the early church. It's the first century church. It is the birth of the bride of Christ which if you are part of Cross Point's um, past series to be continued or you are a part of Cross Point's current series, The Afterlife, you understand why the Bride of Christ and the family of God uh, is spoken of separately. It's pretty incredible. But today we want to talk to you about the authorship of Acts for just a minute because several things are very solidified. Several things are very authenticated. Well, that's a good word to use. Several things are solidified and authenticated within the book of Acts that can help you in your faith. It can help you to explain to others. Here, here's why I'm saying all this. Luke and Acts are really two volumes of the same work. The book of Luke and the book of Acts. It's kind of, it, it could very easily be known as 1st and 2nd Luke. Like 1st and 2nd John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, or 1st Peter, 2nd Peter, 1st uh, Timothy, 2nd Timothy. Uh, they are... Uh, they are one work. They, they, they're not removable, really. They're, they're both written by the uh, physician, Luke. Now, today I'm teaching on this and not reading as much, but it's very important that you listen. Some authors believe that it was written around 62 AD. It's important that you remember Jesus is crucified in 33 AD. So some people believe that this work is written, um, that it is unaware of the letters that Paul is writing, the epistles of Paul, around 62 to 80 AD. Some scholars even say that it was written between 80 and 110 AD. Now, if Jesus died in 33 AD, and it was written somewhere around 100 A.D., quite a bit of time has passed, and 
you know, things could not be remembered as well and possibly even not written by the eyewitnesses uh, to the actual events, but people who had maybe second and third hand knowledge. So why does it matter who wrote it? Why does it matter when it was written? It matters who wrote it because it matters that someone was present during the time of the happening. It matters because Luke says, I investigated the claims concerning Jesus. Who did he investigate them with? Did he investigate them with the people who knew him, the, the disciples who were still alive? Did he investigate them with Mary the mother? Did he investigate them with the third cousin? You know what I mean? Uh, the story that Mary would tell the mother of Jesus would be quite different than the story that the third cousin would tell. Or, you know, he was, Jesus was my great, 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 great uncle would tell. And this is where we're going to actually go back to Mark, the book of Mark, um, to kind of gain some perspective about the when, what matters when or why when matters of the authorship of the book of Acts. Because generally speaking, it's considered and, and believed by me that the authorship had to have happened between 62 AD or sooner, 56 AD even is a number that's out there, but before 70 AD. This, 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 this work, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the New Testament in general, through Revelation, had to have been written before 70 AD. So, one more thing about the author, Luke. Luke was an educated physician. Uh, Luke was friends with Paul. Luke was not an original disciple. He investigated the claims made by those who were with him, you know, those who had beheld his glory, the one, the only begotten son. They touched him, they saw him, they lived in his presence. Luke writes these volumes of Luke Acts, or first and second Luke, if you want to call them that. And it is 27.5% of the New Testament. He is attributed with writing, it's not Paul, Luke writes most of the New Testament. Let's go to Mark chapter 13, and let's recall what the disciples experienced as they were leaving Jerusalem and looking back at the temple. They're with Jesus, and Jesus is getting them ready for the future. Mark chapter 13, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones. I want you to understand that the temple was so large, it would be equated to the work of the, uh, the pyramids. Very few things that were man made and constructed could be uh, as glorious and awe-striking as the temple was. Some of the stones in the temple were over 40 tons and larger. Uh, one day I'll give you the breakdown of the temple, but it is it, 16 feet, 40 feet long stones. Uh, it was enormous. They built it to be earthquake proof. They built it to be indestructible. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And that's another thing you need to understand about the temple. There was a portico. It was several buildings in the complex. And Jesus says to his disciples, now they're, they're up on the Mount of Olives. They're looking back at the temple and these enormous Stones, these enormous, one of the wonders of the world. No one had ever seen anything like it. That was just incredibly built. The stones that were quarried were huge and singular and massive. 
Jesus said to his disciples, Do you see these great buildings? Jesus replied, Not one stone here will be left on top of another. Every one of them, he doesn't say fall, will fall. Every one of them will be thrown down. First of all, a person wasn't going to throw them down, <laughs> okay? Uh, second of all, they didn't have a machine that would throw them down. There wasn't but one thing that could throw them down at this period of time, and that was the entire Roman Empire in all of their might and all of their force with all of the tools they had at their disposal, there wasn't anyone just going to come in there and push it down. An earthquake wasn't going to shake it down. He didn't say, I'm going to tear up one wall. He didn't say, I'm going to throw down one corner. He didn't say, I'm going to make the roof collapse. He didn't say, he said, not one stone in these, this series of multiple buildings. There's multiple buildings here. It's not just a one-time thing. I'm not going to blow up the east corner. I'm not going to drop the roof on one side or mess up the plumbing. He said, not one stone will be left stacked on top of the other. Every single one of them will be thrown down. Now, verse 3 tells us where they are, and I've already told you this. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, looking back at the greatness of of one of the, you know, wonders of the world. As he's sitting on the Mount Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew ask him privately, tell us, when? Now I'm going to go back to why we titled this what we titled this, Why When Matters. As they're sitting on the Mount of Olives off the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen. And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? This is one of the most significant physical prophecies Jesus gives. Now at this point, they're probably thinking, you know, he may be talking in a parable. He may be uh, speaking figuratively. He's probably not talking about, you know, tearing the stones down of the building over there opposite of the Mount of Olives we're sitting on. He's probably talking about tearing down the rocks in our lives, or he's probably talking about removing the hardness of our heart, or maybe he's talking about removing the separation between God and man. Maybe he's talking about, you know, something figurative, some, some grand idea in a parable. Uh, but Jesus was talking about the building itself. He was saying, I will not leave one rock on top of another rock. You need to understand that this building was built on a mount, foundation, but the foundation is 60 to 100 feet at one corner in height, and then the buildings went up. So, and that's also where uh, John would be thrown off. It's also where uh, Jesus led, I mean, uh, Lucifer led Jesus to the corner and said, jump off, you'll be fine, and all these things. But to go, to go back to the here and now, Jesus was not speaking figuratively. He was not speaking parabolically. He wasn't talking about, you know, some figurative prophecy of the future. Jesus was stating, I'm going to remove the temple from the mount. Every rock. And you keep, well, why are you harping on this, Doug? Well, it matters because it leads to the authenticity of the authorship of the Gospels of Jesus Christ. It leads to the authenticity of the timeline of when uh, Matthew through Revelation was written. It wasn't written 110 years after the death of Christ by John's third cousin or Peter's great, 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 great grandson. It wasn't written by people who weren't there and didn't see it. It was actually written by eyewitnesses. And this, this prophecy being recorded here in the book of Mark uh, confirms it as absolute factual. You say, how does it do that, Doug? How does it confirm Matthew through Revelation is absolutely factual in timeline and, and as close to authorship as we can possibly understand or know? Well, here's why. Because the temple was the center of commerce. The temple was the center of faith. The temple was, was grand by any person's standard. It was grand by any uh, generation's standard. It was 
grand by any century or millennium standard. The temple was everything and had been their focal point of both faith and commerce um, <laughs> for as long as anyone could remember, and they really thought that it would be that way forever. Everyone knew about the temple, whether you were Roman, uh, Gentile, Greek, a Jew, uh, the temple was known. It was kind of like the White House uh, in, in as far as being widely known and uh, celebrated or, or the Eiffel Tower or the pyramids of Egypt. It was one of those things that everyone uh, knew of. And Jesus here on the Mount of Olives is telling his disciples, I'm going to take every rock off the other one and I will leave none standing. And we know from history um, that in 70 AD, the Roman Empire, the Roman army, came and wiped every building off the Temple Mount. Pulled, pushed, leveraged every rock, every stone, every building. Guys, this is, this is within less than, it's about 37 years of the death of Jesus Christ. Within 37 years of the death of Jesus Christ, within 37 years of the death of Jesus Christ, there was not a stone or a rock or a wall or a roof or a shed or a lean-to or a... Every piece was pushed off the Temple Mount, and the rocks are laying on the ground today. Don't you think that if the center of commerce, the center of the Jewish faith, the, the Jewish faith ended traditional, original Jewish faith ended in that moment, don't you think if these authors were writing this later than 60? Don't you think if they were writing it later than 70 AD, somebody would have mentioned it? Don't you think they would have alluded to it? Don't you think if something so significant had already happened, like 9-11, that one of these former Jews or that one of these Gentile teachers would have leveraged that truth and said, hey, just like Jesus said he would, just a few years earlier, Jesus took us up on that hill right there. The Mount of Olives, you see right there, we sat on that rock under that tree. Just like he said it would. He has to be the Messiah, Jews. He has to be the Messiah, Gentiles. Just a couple of years ago, he sat us right there and said he wouldn't leave a rock stacked on top of another, and now the Temple Mount is swept clean. Don't you think someone, somewhere, would have mentioned it had it already happened when they wrote it? Someone would have mentioned it as historical value or someone would have mentioned it as, oh my gosh, what a, what a terrorist act. Someone would have mentioned it as a, well, here's just something to know. The temple's down. Or someone would have mentioned it who wanted to carry on the teachings of Jesus Christ and said, just like he told us it would, it happened. There's another confirmation that. But do you know if you go to Rome today that there are pictures of the Romans tearing down the temple and taking the temple's sacred candlesticks, taking the temple's sacred items, that they are painted, that they are hewn, that they are chiseled in stone, that they are on walls and bridges, attesting to the fact of 70 AD and the temple being destroyed, don't you think that someone would have written something?
The New Testament was written by those who observed it. So as we read the book of Acts, I want you to know it wasn't, there wasn't time for myths and legends. It takes about 70, 80, 100 years for myths and legends uh, to form because uh, you have to wait till everybody who was there died off, and then you start telling the celebrated story, not what really happened, but the one that got away story, and it was bigger and better than it was, and all this. Guys, there is no better pinning of the timeline and the authenticity and the accuracy of the Gospels, the letters of Paul, the epistles of Paul, Jude, James, the writer of Hebrews, then the fact Jesus said, I'm going to do it, and within 40 years of his death, it was done, and people who actually heard it, come on. Why didn't they write about it? Because it hadn't happened yet. I hope that you see the significance of these statements. I can assure you that if someone wanted to continue the teachings of Jesus or to make good on the religion of Christianity, somebody would have had enough gumption to say, it was just like he told us it would. He didn't leave a rock stacked on top of another. He used the Roman Empire to do it. He's the Messiah. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will take this, these truths uh, and, and these historical datas and, Father, that you'd give us an understanding of why the when matters and uh, help us to uh, make a better argument for our faith. Um, help us to understand a little more, be armed a little better, not to... Uh, infer conflict, but to rebuke conflict, to have a response, to have an answer, to understand why we believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were who they say they were, and why the book of Acts, and why Peter and Paul, and why we put such an uh, credit in the words of James, the brother of Jesus, or John, the beloved disciple. Why, 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 why? The answers are, answers are fairly clear, and uh, commonsensical <laughs> in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hit the hearts, hit the lights, go crazy on those. I know I didn't get into reading the actual book of that, but we did read some from Mark about the destruction of the temple and why we can look at the account of Acts in the first century. It's very important, that you, not just the what. Don't just have an answer. Know why. Know why you believe. Know why you think. Because it will ground some of your faith and strengthen it, and it will uh, re. Uh, rebuke, refute some of the other things that you think so that you don't think wrongly. And uh, you ask yourself, why do I believe that? Why do I think that? Why do I know about that? Why do I think heaven is somewhere you float around on a cloud? Why do I think heaven is uh, the only place anyone goes? Or why do I think there's a hell? There's, there's, there's reasons. We're reasonable people. Luke was an educated Gentile, not a Kool-Aid drinking Jew. Bye, guys.